Today I'm going to be talking about uh, surrender, surrendering to the Holy Spirit. And um, when we surrender to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit talks to us. Do you guys know that? The Holy Spirit wants to talk to us today and He wants to direct us. And, and if we listen, He will tell us the simplest things at the certain times. And what does it sound like? What does the voice of God sound like? Well, the voice of God sounds like what you read in the Bible. And lots of times the voice of God sounds exactly like the way you sound. By that I mean, as you're reading the Bible out loud, that's, you know, to me, I'm thinking, this is God speaking to me. But also the Holy Spirit, he will speak to your heart and ask you to do something so simple that you guys would think it's just so innocuous. Not, it's just so, I, I missed up using that word. But anyway, uh, it was just so simple that it does not matter to any, does not matter to anything. Like, uh, for instance, real quick, you guys heard me tell this story again and again. And something that someone did to my life was so simple, but it changed my life. And you know what it was? A wave. A wave. That's all it was. I, I, as God is my witness, in a car, I was thinking I'm something hot and I'm, I'm not. But I thought I was. And I saw some guy drive up and slowly passing me. And this just kid just looking out the window like that. And I had an attitude in my heart. And all of a sudden, I just, you know, I'm, I'm tough and... You're not important for me to even give a look to, but I'm going to look to see if you're looking. <laughs> so I looked over to him, and he was just leaning over like this, and he just goes, and I realized, you're an idiot, Terry. Right? That, that was the voice of God. <laughs> it's like, what are you doing? Something like that. You have no idea what it does. And so I don't take those little things lightly. When I feel an urge to wave at someone, when I say an urge to say hello, and there's going to be another urge to say, quick, look away. They may see you. Don't, don't follow that second urge. Go with the first one, okay? And maybe it's like, why don't you text somebody? Why don't you just connect with them? And, and the thing is, when you connect with them, lots of times you will be encouraging them, and who knows, they'll encourage you right back. Thursday, we get together with a bunch of uh, guys, and we pray out there, and we just pray over the church. We pray over the various things uh, in the world. And uh, John Wooten He's part of that group, very, very faithful man. And uh, he started reading a text that he wrote to someone, and it was just so good at the time. I just said, Man, you, I know it's so simple, but will you read that simple little text to us and what happened and how God connected and how God is just working in people's lives? So I just asked him to do that today. So welcome, John. All right. Thank you. Okay. So a little background story. I had a customer... Uh, online. She lives in uh, South Carolina, so I've never physically met her. It was just through texting, and she was trying to order uh, some bedroom furniture for her second home. So I didn't really know that much about her. I didn't really talk to her except, you know, business and dimensions, trying to figure out what she wanted. <clears throat> and through the course of texting, she, you know, would say, oh, thank God, or send me a prayer emoji, which, you know, lots of unbelievers would do that. But I thought, you know, maybe she's a Christian, and then the stuff got delivered and all that worked out. <clears throat> so I decided to text her uh, a positive message about being a Christian. So I didn't really know what to say. <laughs> so I'm like, I just said, very nice, because she was thanking us for the stuff. I said, I appreciate you also appreciate you mentioning the Lord and God in a positive way. My wife and I are believers. We help every week at Celebrate Recovery try to get people restored. <clears throat> she said, or I said, so many people have no one to help them. We've seen many people rescued and put on the right track. We've also seen lots of failures. I said, we go to a Bible-believing church. So which I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for pastor running a strict church <laughs> and believing in the Bible. So then her response, which I've never really talked to her about anything, you know, other than, like I said, dimensions, she goes, I'm one of those people who, oh, I'm going to put on my glasses. <laughs> I'm one of those people who you and your wife have helped. The odds of recovery are around 20%. I was one of those by the grace of God. There was many times in my life when I would have never believed I would live in a house again. God broke me. <laughs> then he delivered me out of bondage. I've been in victory for 18 years. <clears throat> 
So at one point she was homeless, and now she's got two homes. <clears throat> I've been in recovery for 18 years. God has blessed me beyond anything I could ever have dreamed of or imagined. My husband and I have been together 16 years. God gave us a beautiful home in Seneca and now a retirement home where we will go someday. I accept Jesus as a young child, but I strayed away from God. My husband got saved seven years ago. We got baptized together. We go to a Bible-believing church. We do service work <coughs> with the church and we we'll celebrate recovery. I, too, like you, have seen the victories and the failures. I've seen many people die, sadly. But for the ones who made it, God is the source of their success. So this, this woman really uplifted me. I was kind of traumatized by it. Stay right there. John and Terry have a heart for those who are lost. They have a heart for those who are the outcasts. They have a heart for those who are really struggling. John is like a dad to so many people. You have no idea the testimonies that he talks about, the people that come that work for him and he helps and how he, the way he fathers is very unique. <laughs> are you stupid? No, not, not all like that. But no, he goes, you know, you could be doing so much better. Don't, don't do something stupid. Make the right choices and your life will be better. He just lays it out simple and straight and real. And I just love that. And he's, he's touching lives all the time. And he and his wife are part of the Celebrate Recovery, which is at the Cross, a wonderful program that Debbie and Hector Fernandez is really running. And uh, so they have a part in it. And they go faithfully every Monday night. And he talks about the people that he'll see someone over there. He goes, oh, my goodness, that one was really wacky. But then the Lord would just say, be friends with him. He's like, oh, God, that, that one too? You know, so he will go over and he will befriend them. And next thing you know, they're texting they're sharing. He's constantly speaking into their lives. And it's, God wants us to speak into the lives of this world because this world needs the truth. They need the real thing. And guess what? Are you, if you're a believer, you've got it. You've got it. And you may feel like, what do I have to offer? The same, that Peter, same thing that Peter and John had. Nothing. I have nothing. But such as I have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ. Be whole. Be well. Be real, be delivered, be set free. Amen? That's what we have. And you don't have to have it polished. You don't have to have it worked out. You just be, let God use you. Surrender. Say surrender. Surrender to what God wants to do. So I want to pray for Terry and I want to pray for John right now. And if someone might want to lay hands on Terry over there. Heavenly Father, I just lift up the Wooten family to you. And I, I remember John. Hallelujah, I remember John. And John remembers me, God. <laughs> Lord, I thank you for what you can do in lives. I thank you, Lord, for your salvation. I thank you for your deliverance. And as this lady said in the text, even when we accept you at a young age and we walk away, you don't walk away from us. You wait for us again and again and again. And Lord, we come back to you because you're constantly touching our hearts, constantly putting things in our past. And so Lord, I thank you for that. I thank you for John. I thank you for Terry's heart. For the Lord, it's the same heart that you have that beats for people. Yes, you came to save the lost. You came to save the broken. Hallelujah. And Lord, we're thankful for that. And I pray your blessings and opportunities and anointing because as John and Terry are faithful in speaking and doing the things they do, Lord God, I pray that you give them even more influence in this world. Amen. More influence of the Holy Spirit that's in you. May that pour out into the world in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John. Simple. Amen. Amen. Hey, uh, I had you say the word surrender, and that's really what I want to talk about today. Last week, I talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And what God wants to do in our lives. And one of the things is this. The key to an empowered Christian life. Not the key to a, a failure. Not the key to brokenness. Not the key, the key to an empowered, overcoming, victorious Christian life. is found in a relationship with the Holy Spirit. It is. It's not in gritting our teeth. It's not in trying harder. It's not doing it in a 10-point plan. It's, Lord, I surrender to you. 
flow through me. And the Bible says that when we're baptized in the Holy Spirit, that we're baptized in him. It's kind of like a, a David Hernandez. He gave this illustration. It was the Titanic on the water. It's on the water. It's on the water, and it's influencing it, and it's moving around. But then when it sinks, the water starts filling every single compartment in it, and there's a bunch in there. And as they slowly fill up with this water, all of a sudden that boat goes under and goes under and goes under, and it's actually baptized in the water. And now it's totally influenced by the water that's around it. It's, it's really not influencing the water anymore. It's in, the water's influencing its life. And that's the way it is with God in our lives, in a very simple sort of way. The Holy Spirit comes in when we're saved, but he's there, and it's kind of like us, the boat on the water. But he says, there's more. I want to give you more. I want to empower you. I want you to hear me talk to you. I want to use you in situations beyond your abilities, beyond your skills, beyond your training. But it comes from me, the Holy Spirit. And it's supernatural. And he'll do supernatural things in your life. So when we surrender to him, we say, Holy Spirit, baptize me. Fill me, Jesus, right now. Baptize me in the Holy Spirit. He takes us under and now we are influenced by the Holy Spirit in every area of our lives. And you don't know. And you just touch lives. And again, the Bible says it's like rivers of living water that comes from the innermost part of you. And the innermost part of you is your spirit. Rivers of living water flow out of that. And it flows into the outer shells of us, which is our soul, our mind, will, and emotions. And so the rivers of living water that saved us and just bubbling up there. And they just go and they just fill all these compartments of our lives. And it changes the way we think. It heals our mind. It changes the way uh, we uh, feel on our emotions. It changes uh, all these things about us. And then it doesn't stop there. We just keep sinking in the Holy Spirit, and then it goes and influences our body, influences the way we act, our behavior, how we talk, where we go, what we do. That's what God wants to do. Amen? There's lots of Christians that are not really influenced by God. They're saved. They're going to make it to heaven. But there's more. There's so much more. And I don't want to just barely get by. I barely made it out of high school. I hate that feeling. I want to make it into heaven dancing and rejoicing, amen? And that's what God wants to do. And the only way I could do that is not through my might, not through my power, but by God's spirit, says the Lord, amen? So we need to believe in that. We need to trust that, that the Holy Spirit wants to baptize us in all that areas of our lives. Uh, so the key to an empowered Christian life is the influence of the Holy Spirit. If we're to break free from the world's influence in our lives, and by the way, the world has really influenced the church today. It causes them to change some of their uh, theologies. It's caused them to change what's, what the Word of God says and ignore what the Word of God says and, and go with the influence of the world says to them just so they can be popular, just so they can be loved. Jesus says, you're not going to be loved in this world if you belong to me. The world hated me. You think they're going to love you? No. Not if you're following me. And so we need to know that uh, we need to have the influence of the Holy Spirit so we can break free from the world's influence in our lives. Some of us today are too influenced by this world. I know I was. Conquering, we want the influence of the Holy Spirit so that we can conquer sin in our lives. We want the influence of the Holy Spirit so we can be a better dad and a better mom, a better husband, a better wife, so we can be a better person, amen? And you... You need the Holy Spirit to do that and have it, have it stick. To break free from powerful strongholds, from addictions, to conquer anxiety and fear in our lives. That comes from the Holy Spirit. And that your mind will be set free from the wrong thinking and live the life that God has called us to live. And that all happens through the empowering and the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And that's why we should want that. Amen? It should be something that we should desire. And know this, God desires it for you as well. Do you know that? I don't know if you, do you know that? <laughs> God wants us to be baptized in his uh, spirit so that we, he can move in our lives. So one of the things we learn about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, to get it, you just have to know the truth. The Holy Spirit's inside of you now, but he wants to be set free. He wants to immerse you in him. And then you have to just ask Jesus. It's so simple. I love how God is so simple. And also, we need to surrender. And today I want to talk about surrender. What, what does it look about? I would just want to expand on that a little bit more, okay? Surrender. Uh, the healing and life and power that we long for comes through surrender. It, that's crazy. If you don't surrender, what's going to happen? If you don't surrender to the way God does it, what does it mean by surrender? I'm not talking like the way the world surrenders. I'm not talking like this. Give up. Give up all your dreams. Just lay down and die. That's not the type of surrender we're talking about. I'm talking about the surrender is this. 
I have to do it my way. I have to do it the way I think. I have to totally understand it before I'll step out and do it. Amen? That, that's, that's us trying to hold on, trying to be in control. God says, trust in my word, obey, and then when you obey, you're going to see the results, and then you're going to understand. But until then, you're going to have to walk in faith, son. You're going to have to walk in faith, daughter. And that's what God wants us to do. So to surrender to God, it's us surrendering the way we do things, surrendering our will to follow what God tells us to do and trust him. Amen? So if you don't surrender, you will try to change yourself in your own strength. And you don't have enough strength to do that. You cannot accomplish the work of God in your own strength. And again, I want to use the scripture I just said here, and it's found in Zechariah. It's not by might. It's not by what's inside of you. It's not by power. It's not what the world can give you out there. But it's by my spirit, says the Lord, is the only way that we can have the change and make a difference. Amen? Does that make sense? It's not in you. You ain't got it. And the world can't give it to you as well. When he gave the scriptures talking about these armies coming, it says, I'm going to go and ask these kings, give me their horses and help me. He says, you're not going to find victory in that. You're not going to find victory in that. If you want to build this wall, if you want to rebuild the Jerusalem, if you want to see this mountain move, you're going to have to go through me. You, this mountain looks so big in your life, but I can speak to mountains and tell them to go in Jesus' name. So this is either real or it's not. And I'm telling you right now, if you surrender to God, you will experience the realness of it. I'd rather experience it than read about you experiencing it. Does that make sense? Because I want it, okay? How about you? Maybe about you. All right. So we all want that. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Yet, in our mind, surrenders just sounds so crazy. The world thinks it's crazy, but yet it's God's way. Let me read you something that's found in 1 Corinthians 127. This is God's way. God shows the things... The world considers foolish. You go to church? Oh, you're, that's sweet. That's awesome. I mean, that's, that's sweet. Keep it to yourself. I don't want to hear about it. You go to church? Oh, that, that, that's nice. Or you go to church? Man, you, that's a crutch for those who don't have a mind. That's a crutch for those who don't have uh, the strength in their own selves. I'm a strong man. I'm a strong woman. I don't need Jesus. God shows the things that the world considers foolish in order to show those who think that they're wise. Let me read that again. I said it wrong. God shows the things of the world that the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think that they are wise. The world thinks it's wise. And if you think like the world, you'll think the same way. And he also chose the things that are powerless. Why? So he can shame those who are powerful. See, God's going to get the worship. God is going to get the glory. Our flesh is not going to have that glory whatsoever. Amen? God's kingdom is upside down. It really is. To this world, it's upside down. For instance, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. You want to be comforted? You need to mourn. What are you talking about? You need to say, I need you, God. I, I'm sorry for the sins of my life. I want to comfort you. Uh, if you want to be first in this world, you've got to be last. You've got to be the servant of those. It, that's, that's, not, that's not what my uh, the corporate, that's what my college degree told me to do. I got to walk on people and I got to climb that ladder and I got to get up there. It says, no, no, no. If you want to be first in my kingdom, you've got to be last like this little child and you've got to be a servant. If you want to inherit the kingdom of God, you've got to become poor in spirit. If you want victory, you must surrender. God is looking for the weak. God is looking for the emptied and God is looking for the surrendered so that he can show himself strong in them. See, it's all about God being glorified because nothing we do can save the world or save ourselves. So we have to shine the light on the one who does. And the way we live our life has to point to him. And the only way our life can point to God is if he allows his spirit inside of us to do the pointing. The Holy Spirit is so good at pointing out where Jesus is. The Holy Spirit is so good to leading people to Jesus Christ. And God wants to do it in our lives and how we live our lives. And the only way that can happen is when we surrender. I surrender to you, God. I surrender to you, Holy Spirit. Amen? Hallelujah. Surrender is realizing that nothing I do in my own strength will have eternal or lasting results. I surrender to you, God. I surrender to your way of doing things. If I'm in control, I'm going to use my own power. But Lord, if I surrender to you, if God's in control, guess what? You get God's power. <laughs> that is awesome. With God, say it with me, with God, all things are possible in our lives. Amen. So today I want to talk about how to surrender to the Holy Spirit. I'm going to give you four quick points. Number one, 
They always say quick, and I really don't mean to lie. So anyway, that's not a lie. But anyway, number one, if you want to surrender to God, you have to have a reverence for his word. We have to have a reverence for God's word. We have to have a deep respect. We have to honor God's word. We don't just... Here's what ha can happen. Well, first, let me read your scripture, and I'll tell you what can happen. Isaiah 66, 2. This is God talking. He says... My hands have made both heaven and earth. They and everything in them, they're mine. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will bless those who have humble and contrite hearts, those who tremble at my word. God wants us to have a deep reverence for his word because it's his word that created everything. It's his word that saved us. He sent his word and he healed their diseases. It's his word. It's what he says. And we need to listen to his word and we need to make it a part of our lives. So when we do those things, when we reverence the word, we can, that's surrendering to the will of God. That's surrendering to the Holy Spirit. We should tremble. What does that mean? It seems, that means that we need to take, when God speaks, we don't take it lightly. When God speaks, when we read the Bible, we don't just take it lightly. We just don't take it in a cavalier sort of way. We have to just stop. Hey, God's speaking right now, you know. I'm going to read this and God is speaking. And I think we in the church, sometimes we get just so jaded to it, just so, you know, we just, we don't think nothing of it. We just kind of just gloss over it. And when we gloss over it, we don't have the respect that we should have over it. We become apathetic. We're no longer listening. I don't want to become apathetic. Then after we become ap apathetic, we start to neglect what God's word says to do. And when we start neglecting God's word, then we will start disobeying what God's word says. It's a path that the enemy has set before us. And God says, hey, if you want to have me and you, and you want to see me influence your life, you want to see me influence your family, you want to see me influence your community, you want to see me influence your church, I'm telling you what, you surrender to me and reverence my word, what it says. Make it holy. Put it into your heart. Believe it. Receive it. Say, yes, Lord, that's, that's for me. I love it, Lord God. I thank you for your word. And don't neglect it. Don't neglect reading it because when you neglect reading it, then you'll become apathetic and then next thing you know, you're going to be disobeying God's word. Amen? Unless we tremble at his word, we will not be surrendering. And when we neglect God's word in our lives, there's a danger of creating a warped image of who God is. Now listen to this. I'm going to tell you a story, a couple of stories here, but we become in danger of creating a warped image of God. When we neglect reading what God says and God reveals himself in his word a lot, he's holy. He's powerful, he's wise, he's smart, which goes hand in hand, okay. <laughs> uh, he, uh, he's really good with words too. And God does all these things and he's, he's patient, he's kind, he's loving, he's long-suffering, he's forgiving. This is who God is. But if you don't read that in the word of God and you don't take it in and you don't honor the word of God, then you're gonna start creating a different image of God in your mind. The Bible says that's creating a graven image. The Ten Commandments, commandment number two. Number one, you shall have no other gods and you shall not make any graven images unto me. Meaning, don't make up a God that's really not like me. How would you like it if, um, I don't know how, where I'm going to go with this, but how would you like it if um, your husband was, wives, if your husband was to introduce you to talk about you to someone and he talked about someone entirely different the wrong hair color the wrong size the wrong glasses no glasses you know all this kind of stuff you're thinking who are you talking about you're not talking about me you know you, you'd be ticked off and so many people they try to talk about god and they try to create a god and so what happens they don't read the word of god they don't know the word of god and they don't reverence god's word and so what they do they make up stuff and in their mind they do think that all the time all the time this week alone, I talked to three different people. I'm not going to give their names or tell you what, all the details of it, but three different people. And one thing that was com two things that was common in all three people. Number one, they didn't know the word of God, so they had a made up stuff about who God is and what he does and what he believes and what he likes and all that he doesn't like and that sort of stuff. They had a warped view of who God was, and that's the God that they were worshiping. And guess what? That God they were worshiping couldn't save them. That guy that was worshiping could not help them in their situation, and their lives were totally a disaster. Their, listen to me. Their lives were disasters, all three of them. And I'm talking to them going, where did you get that view of God? Oh, it just seems right. It just feels right. 
And when you don't follow the word of God, the devil knows the next thing you're going to go to is the feelings. And boy, does he love to tickle your feelings. And he'll come up with all kinds of crazy things in our minds and imaginations. So we need to reverence what God's word says. Because otherwise, we will have a warped image of who God is. His holiness and his righteousness. Amen. Even in the church, we can do that as well. If you want to reverence God's word... and if you want to reverence God's word and surrender to the Holy Spirit, you have to, number one, you have to elevate his word above your own opinion. Amen? Yeah, there's a toe. Okay, anyway, if you say, this is my opinion of God. God says, I don't care what your opinion of me. This is who I really am. <laughs> Amen? Okay, you have to elevate what it says. You may feel like this is what I think God's like, but you know, I read this here and I'm thinking, well, it really means this. It really means that. Have you guys ever met people like that? Is it you? Okay, anyway, here we go. <laughs> Elevate his word above your own opinion. Elevate his word above how you were raised at home. Well, that's not how we did it at home. Well, that's not, this is what the word of God says. Elevate God's word above your own politics. Oh, slap, slap, slap. Okay, elevate God's word above your culture. Well, that's not how we do it here. Ah, it doesn't matter. What does God say? You know, maybe the reason why your culture's messed up or the reason why this culture is messed up, whatever it is, is because you've neglected God's word. Amen. You've not reverenced it. You've thought, well, I can create the God I want to create, a God that makes me happy, a God who is my convenience, the God who lets me sin the way I want to sin and do the things I want to do. That's exactly what's happening. That's a false image, and that's an idol. And God says, don't do that. Don't do that. We need to elevate God's word above even what our parents say. So, we reverence God's word when we obey. Say obey. <clears throat> Excuse me. When we obey his word and his voice without compromise. Without compromise. Psalms 1911 says this. I've hidden your word in my heart, God, so that I might not sin against you. He didn't want to sin against him, so he reverenced his word and he put it in his heart so that he would not do those things. And he was obedient to what God said. James 1.22 but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Let's read that together. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. You're following that false God. God speaks to us through his written word. And God sometimes speaks to us in our heart through the Holy Spirit. He gives us a word. And we listen to that or we follow along. So we have to be constantly reminded that he's guiding us and he's reminding us. So we have to remember that and have to... Follow what God is saying. And I love the fact that John, it, it, again, it's sometimes it's just a simple, small voice. But when you have the Spirit of God and you're obeying God, you will follow that small voice. It says, I'm going to just respond to them this way. You have no idea those things that God's doing in our lives. Let me give you an example. The Holy Spirit will speak to your heart. You've read the word and you know what the word. But God also speaks to us today. He speaks to our hearts. He speaks to us. He says, I want you to help this person right there. See that person in need? I want you to go and help them. You know, you're a Christian. You know you're a Christian. You're walking with the Lord. You're walking through a store. You're walking in a situation. You see a car issue. Whatever it may be, God may, God may put it on your heart right away. Help that person. And when you hear that, you'll hear that right away. And it will just be real quick. And immediately following it, it will be something else going like this. No, 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 no. I got this excuse. You can't do this. You got that. You got this. You got that. Oh, if you do this, this will happen. If you, uh, you know, it just goes on and on and on. By the way, that voice gives you a lot more reasons why not to or in the one that just says, do it. Amen? <laughs> or uh, example, Holy Spirit tells you, uh, speaks to your heart to help someone or maybe to pray for someone. Oh, Lord, that's so embarrassing. The room's not empty yet. When this room is empty and the lights are down, then I'll go pray for them. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It ain't happening that way in the grocery store. They don't do that. So take that opportunity and just go pray for that person in that situation. I'm telling you what, there's, there's joy in that. There's joy. There's blessings in that. And you're blessing others and God blesses you. Hallelujah. Pray for someone. Or when the Holy Spirit speaks to you to bless someone, to help someone out, to give to them, whatever, may, any way you can be a blessing to them, to give a word to them. You know, I've seen you with your kids, and you know, the, that just reminded me of something in the word of God. Can I just share it with you real quick? Boom. You want to know what that could do to someone? It could wreck their world in a good way. Amen? Hallelujah. Stop what you're doing. Maybe God just says, hey, just stop right now. I need you to pray. Lord, I don't know what to pray for. Then just pray in tongues. I've given you my, my spiritual language. You're filled with the Holy Spirit. Just 
pray and the Holy Spirit will pray for you and through you. I don't know what to pray. Let the Holy Spirit pray for you then. I mean, that's the best person to pray for me. I would love for you guys to pray for me, but if I had my choices between you and the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, here I come. You know what I'm saying? We want the Holy Spirit to pray for us, and he does it through praying in tongues in our own private spiritual language. And if you want some questions about that, I have questions about that, I would love to go over lunch with you over it, okay? Buy my lunch and we'll do it. Okay, here we go. No, I'll buy yours. We surrender to the Holy Spirit in our lives when we reverence and tremble at God's word and when we obey what he says. Amen? So reverence God's word. Obey what God's word says. Actually, I, my last point kind of is nested in that, but we'll just we'll go through it. Number two, how to surrender to the Holy Spirit? Let's be mindful of his presence. Be mindful of his presence. He's with me. He's in me. Think about that. I go everywhere I go, he goes. I have the Holy Spirit with me. And that's good. It's going to cause you to just surrender. Listen to this. It's found in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? It's his dwelling place. That's where he lives. He's in you. Your body, your body is God's temple. Who lives in you and he is given to you by God. You do not belong to yourself. I like that part. You don't belong to yourself. You're, this is God's house. When you, when you uh, surrender to Jesus Christ, he puts his spirit in you, and now you are God's house. And don't try evicting him. <laughs> Amen? Don't try evicting him. You need to recognize that the Holy Spirit's living inside you, and just pause on that for, and think about that. Merely, uh, many, I'm sorry, many dearly loved Christians have fallen victim to the lie that uh, I think I've lost the Holy Spirit because I just don't feel him anymore. Listen, you may have at one point in your life surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. Then all of a sudden there's just this empty, barren, dry season in your life. And maybe it's been many, many years. Well, there could be lots of reasons for that. It could be a life that says, not surrender to God. It's a life that says, I want to hold on and be in control. And God's going to step back and says, I'll wait. I'll wait. I love you and I'll wait. Or maybe it's because you're sinning and you can't hear the voice of God. You're not responding to the voice of God. God will try and get your attention. He's trying to do it right now through this message. Don't ignore the voice of God in that situation. Recognize that he lives inside of you. And like I said, so many dearly loved Christians, they feel like God has left them because they feel it. They don't sense him anymore. Or uh, maybe they've done something wrong and God has removed the Holy Spirit from them. That's not how God works. The Holy Spirit is there to stay and reside because you are his temple. You are the seal. Matter of fact, what we need to do is stop thinking that way and change the way we think. And let's change this way. Um, stop elevating your feelings. I feel he's left me. You know what? If you feel that way, then stop and just say, okay, I'm not going to. I feel that way. Now I'm going to do something about it. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to elevate God's word instead of my feelings. Instead of sitting there going, yeah, I do feel that. Yeah, I do feel that. Why God? Why God? Why God? Why God? Why God? And instead of just elevating your feelings right there, stop. Elevate the word of God. And the word of God says this. He is giving you another advocate who will never leave you. Say, never leave you. God will never leave you. I am sealed with the Holy Spirit. I'm sealed. No one's going to break that seal. The devil can't break that seal. And he's been trying for years and years. I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit. I do not belong to myself. I belong to God. Amen. We need to elevate what God's word says. And even when you say the word, you still may say, I, I still don't feel it. Well, then say it some more. Say it some more. Shout it some more. Sing it in a certain way. You need to elevate what God says over your feelings. And then your life will be a lot more victorious and a lot more empowered. Amen? Okay. I, I must be stepping on toes because you guys are quiet. Some feel they've committed final sin and the Holy Spirit's done with them. Remember, the Holy Spirit's inside of you, even when you make a mistake. The Holy Spirit's inside of you, even when you sin. What you need to do is confess that sin and get it out of the way. Get it out of the way. Amen. He will not abandon you. So think. Well, think about it this way. Would God take his Holy Spirit out of you because you failed at being holy? And the Holy Spirit's the only thing that can cause you to live a life of holiness? Would he take that very thing away from you as punishment for not being holy? That's kind of crazy, isn't it? He doesn't want to take the Holy Spirit from you. He wants the Holy Spirit to influence you. He wants the Holy Spirit to change you. He wants the Holy Spirit to change your mind with his word and his power. So we need to believe this, that our feelings are liars and the word of God is true. Amen. 
So when, you, when we are mindful of God in every moment of our lives, then we begin to involve him in everything we do. When you're mindful of God in that moment, every moment of your life, then it's going to change the things that you do. You're going to involve him. You're going to involve, you're going to ask for his opinion. You're going to ask for his advice. You're going, and when you walk down the street and you see some situation going on and you realize, I'm not walking alone. I'm walking with the Spirit of God. Wherever I go, God, the Holy, hey, Holy Spirit wants to go. Look, Holy Spirit, I'm going right. I'm going left now. You can't, out move, you can't outmaneuver him, okay? Everywhere you go, the Holy Spirit goes with you. And so we need to be mindful of that and then allow that to cause us to think that it's going to cause us to change how we do things. Check this out. When you're mindful of the Holy Spirit in you, it changes the way you behave. Example, one of the things I don't do is I don't go around telling people, Hi, my name is Terry Baldwin. I'm Pastor Terry Baldwin. I don't tell people that. I don't. And why is that? My wife asked me, he goes, why don't you introduce yourself as pastor? I said, because then they'll act different. They don't act the same. When they realize that uh, you're a pastor, they're mindful that, hey, there's a pastor amongst us. We better clean it up a little bit. Amen? You ever, ever have that? It used to be they clean it up a lot. It's like, oh, sorry, pastor. I still get people say, I'm sorry for saying that. I say, hey, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And then go on to something else, just being real. But it changes the way they behave because there's someone different there. That's the same thing with the Holy Spirit. How about this? Maybe you guys can relate to this. Do you ever drive fast? You ever sped? sped? How, how about this one? You're driving down the road, you listen to the music, you're beat bopping to it and all that kind of stuff. And all, you're going fast because when I listen to fast music, I drive faster. I don't know why. I, it's just this way it is. And so I'm driving fast and all of a sudden, I look right over here and there's a cop I did not see who's getting ready to pull into the same road I'm in. It's like, oh, oh. Just that empty feeling. It's like, oh. Once I, I'm, I'm aware that the, the, the police officer is with, with me, it changes my behavior. <laughs> it, it changes my driving habits. It changes the way I stand up, hands at 2 and 10. You know, like, ah, oh, how you doing? Is it, hi, hi, uh, it changes you. Why? Because you're mindful that that police officer is within your proximity. We need to have the same thing. Everywhere you go, church, the Holy Spirit's with you. Let him change the way you do things. Let him change the way you behave. Let him change the way you respond. Let him change you. Hallelujah. Amen? So, yeah, I like that example too. Um, your body is the holy temple of God. You do not belong to yourself. You do not belong to yourself. And again, not only, check this out, not only is the Holy Spirit with you, but you are his. That mouth that you talk out of, that's the Holy Spirit's mouth. Those ears that you use to hear things or the things you're listening to, those are the Holy Spirit's ears. The things that you see with your eyeballs, guess what? Those eyeballs, they're the Holy Spirit's eyeballs. We have to be mindful that what we let in our lives and what we do and what we say, this isn't ours anymore. We surrendered. We are not our own. We have been bought with a price, a high price, and we belong to God. Amen? So, are we doing, what are we doing with our, our, the Holy Spirit's mouth? What are we saying with the Holy Spirit's mouth? Are we speaking life into a situation or are we speaking death into a situation? That's the Holy Spirit's mouth. He wants to speak life. Holy Spirit, you're with me. This is your mouth. How do you want me to respond to this? Quickly, they're getting ready to leave. Tell me. <laughs> that sort of thing. You know what? Listen, when, you, when you're in the habit of stuff like that, then it starts becoming very natural because that's who you are from here on out. The Holy Spirit is making us into the image of Jesus Christ. It's a process. It's a process. Hallelujah. And guess what? That process will go quicker the more we're surrendered to God. And I have to surrender to God on a daily basis. Amen. Hallelujah. I need to be mindful of the Holy Spirit's presence in my life. I need to be mindful of who the Holy Spirit is. I need to be mindful of his nature, what he does. I need to be mindful of the Holy Spirit's likes and his dislikes. So, that I don't apply them, so I can apply them or not apply them to my life. Hallelujah. The truth changes our behavior. Amen. And, and, and one more thing, and I'll just go on to one more. We need to be mindful of the Holy Spirit. We need to sometimes just slow down. We need to relax. We need to have quiet time. Amen. And those, it, it is, it, I, that's difficult for me. I, I, my quiet time is I'm asleep. But anyway, we need to take time to pray. We need to take time to read. So, so number one. To be surrendered to the Holy Spirit, we need to have reverence for his word. 
We need, number two, we need to be mindful of his presence with us always. And then number three, we need to live a lifestyle of repentance. If you want to be influenced by the Holy Spirit, you want to surrender to the Holy Spirit, then you have to have a life of repentance. I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry, Lord. John, 1 John 1, 9 says this, and this is the amplified version. If we freely admit that we have sinned, and if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, true to his own nature and promises, and he will forgive our sins, hallelujah. And, he, and I love this, and he will cleanse us continually from all unrighteousness, our wrongdoings, everything not in conformity with his will and his purpose. So we need to be, have a lifestyle of constantly repenting. You need to say, Lord God, you know, if, if you haven't sinned that day, that's fantastic. If you have, stop. Don't wait. Say, oh, well, I'll just collect these sins in my pocket, and then later on tonight or maybe at the end of the week when I go to church, that's when I'll ask God to forgive me. And you just collect those things. Don't do that. Don't allow it to pile up. Immediately just say, I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry, Holy Spirit. I, I don't want to grieve you. You're here with me right now. You saw that. You heard that. You know what I thought because you know you created my mind. You know my heart. You know what's in it. I'm sorry. And confess it. He wants you to confess it. Why? Because he wants it out of the way. Because God can't have it. It comes between us and God. Our sins come between us and God. Hallelujah. All right. Let me give you, a, I'm going to say something, and I'm going to explain it, and how we can overcome it. And I'm going to use a, a pretty strong illustration. But temptation is not an event. Oops, I fell into sin. There was a pothole of sin right there, and I fell into it. <laughs> it's not like that at all. Right. Temptation is a process. It's a process in our lives. Let me give you an example. An affair. You know an affair is wrong. When you look at a person on Instagram, and you, you look at them with the wrong motives, and you're thinking... You know, I'm going to connect with them. I'm going to, I knew them from a long time ago. I'm going to check out their profile. You knew it was wrong. You knew you shouldn't be doing that sort of thing at that moment. But you go to check out the profile. The next thing you know, you, you send them a little short message. You just drop a little chat message and you connect with them. And the next thing you know, you're talking with them, continuing. And you know you really shouldn't be. And the next thing you know, you're doing a little bit of flirting. It's a process. And then after a little bit of flirting, the next thing you know, you, you're meeting up, connecting, and you're connecting and talking when, without others around. And the next thing you know, there's an affair. You didn't fall into that affair. It was a process. It was a process of wrong choices. It was a process of, of obeying your flesh and obeying the word of God in that situation. You knew it was wrong all the way. But you ignored the Holy Spirit's prompting. It's a process. Temptation was not at that moment. It was, we, what, what happens is we've conditioned ourselves to say yes to our flesh and no to the Holy Spirit. I can tell you in my own mind, my own mind, in my own life, I remember doing certain things and knowing it's wrong. And, I, and almost in my mind's eye, I see myself doing this to God. I, uh, 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 I'm just going on. Like, I, you know, you didn't, you didn't see that thought. You didn't hear that thing in my mind. And I just went on and just did what I wanted to do. That's what happens. It's a process. We don't fall into sin. It's because we've chosen and the wrong things. We said yes to sin. We said yes to the flesh. We said no to the Holy Spirit. God says, I want you to have a lifestyle of repentance. And when, that means you're going to have to say no to these things. But when you do sin, come to me right away. Don't turn your back to me. Don't ignore me. Stop what you're doing. In the, even if you're in the middle of it, whatever it is, stop. Immediately stop at that moment. This is why God tells us in Romans 13, 14, make no provisions for, neither even think about, gratifying the flesh, it says, make no provisions for the flesh, not even thinking about it or gratifying it in regards to its improper desires. Don't make any room for it. Kill it. Stop it. I mean, it's not like one of those things like, oh, well, I just got to put up with this burden that's following me over there. You know, just kind of look at this sin that's just following you. What you should be doing is just killing it at that moment. Amen? God has given you his word, and what you use, it's a sword, and you speak it against it. It says, no, I will not do that flesh. No, I will not go against my God. I will not sin against my God. I say, no, in Jesus' name, no. If you don't know what to say, just say, no, no, no. Amen? <laughs> no, no, no. There's a show where this guy just said, no, 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 no. Oh, it's Gilligan's Island. Never mind. Anyway, it's an episode of Gilligan's Island. They say, you can say no, Gilligan. You can say no, church. Amen? You can say no. Hallelujah. We have to kill the flesh. We can't give it breathing room. And uh, if you do, if you follow the flesh, you're going to go into bondage. This may, you know, 
it's not, maybe it's not a moral thing. Maybe it has to do with uh, drugs. Maybe it has to do with addictions. Maybe it has to do with uh, uh, something that wants a hold of your life. Say no. Stop right there. And, and then even in the middle of it, put it down. Say, I'm, I'm not even going to finish this thing that I had. I say no. God, forgive me for my sin. Forgive me for my sin. Hallelujah. Um, many think this. Well, it's just a little white lie, or I'm not really gossiping. It's my wife, for crying out loud. Right? I, I can tell her some stuff. Oh, but it's, I can't wait to get home to tell her, though. You know what I'm saying? Whatever it may be. Before you know it, those little white lies, those things that you follow through, those the, the little gossips, they will destroy friendships. They'll destroy relationships. They'll divide churches. They can cause a church. Because you could not control your tongue. You couldn't say no to it. You're falling into lust again. Why? Because you choose not to control your eyes. You cannot, uh, you start compromising on the word. You start compromising on your prayer life because you just don't feel like it. You follow the feelings. You, so you compromise on it. You don't do it. And you become weaker and weaker and weaker. You, comp- you compromise on your attendance at church. This isn't for you because you're here. Amen. Hey, those on satellite or whatever it is, <laughs> Facebook, come to church. We need you. And it's for us. It's for us to grow. It's for us to sharpen each other. Amen? And I'm glad you guys are here. I'm glad you guys encourage me as well. But when we compromise on church attendance, the enemy chips away at our spiritual strength. And we become weaker and weaker. When that temptation comes, it's not that we fall into it. It's because we had a, a progression that went and led right into that. Amen? Amen. You've been conditioning yourself to say yes to sin. You've been conditioning yourself to say yes to sin. The, the way to get out of being conditioning yourself to say yes to sin is to say, Lord, I'm sorry. It's to have a lifestyle of repentance. God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Good news. Hallelujah. Um, I'm just going to skip ahead here. I'm going to look at uh, 1 John 1, 9 again. It's still up there, right? Let's look at 1 John 1, 9 again. If... Say if. If If we freely admit that we have sinned and confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and he will forgive our sins and cleanse us continually from all unrighteousness. The condition is this, if we confess our sins. That's the only thing on our part. We confess our sins, and then God does the rest. What does God do next? God is faithful. Faithful meaning he'll forgive you again and again, and he's faithful to forgive again and again and again. He is faithful. He is just. He has a right to forgive because he paid for our sins. He, not to have our sins, but he paid the penalty for our sins. So he has the right to forgive if he wants to forgive. And he wants to forgive. And all unrighteousness is removed. That's another thing that he does. He removes us. He just takes that filth off of us and cleanses us, cleans us up for him. Amen. In every way, he makes us like Jesus Christ. And finally, the last one is this. And Jimmy, if you can come up. And this one I've actually already spoke about. Um, but we've talked about reverencing his word. We've talked about being mindful of his presence. And we've talked about living in a lifestyle of repentance. And this last one is this. Act in faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so we need to just say, you know what, Lord, I've heard this. It's from your word. I'm going to check it out. And everything I've seen is from your word. I'm going to say yes, and I'm going to do what I've been told to do by you. Amen? So act in faith. Hebrews 11.1 says this. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, and it's the evidence of things not yet seen. Faith is not wishful thinking. And sometimes we do that. I get that. But faith is not wishful thinking. Faith is putting your trust in what God has said and says, you know what? I'm going to put actions to this. I'm going to put substance to this. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence. And what is the evidence? Your life is saying, I believe you. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I've not seen it right now, but I believe it. And I've, you've been showing yourself faithful in so many ways. I'm going to put actions to my faith. Faith without works is dead faith. Can't save you. You're going to have to put your hope all in Jesus Christ and ask him to forgive you for your sins. When you ask him to forgive you for your sins, that's your faith going into action. And then God can do it. God can do it. And it's the same way with our lives. Uh, we want to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Lord, you said all these things, being in your word, be mindful that you're with me. Lord, living a life of repentance. If I do these things, Lord God, that you will come in and you will empower me, you'll fill me with your spirit. See, there's one baptism of the Holy Spirit, but there's many, 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 many fillings of the Holy Spirit. And God wants to fill us again and again and again and again. If you've been baptized the Holy Spirit, you can have that. I mean, don't, don't float back up to the top, sink into the Lord. If you've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, you can be because God wants to do it. He wants to empower your life. 
in a very powerful way, spiritual way. So my actions, my faith working is the evidence of the things that God wants for our lives. For instance, heaven, that's where, you know the prayer Jesus taught us how to pray? As it is in heaven, so it should be on earth. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So in heaven, it's healing. Say, Lord God, I need to pray for healing. Uh, you know, maybe I won't see it right now. It doesn't matter. I believe it because you said it and you're not a liar. That gives me boldness and that gives me confidence. Right, Holy Spirit? Right. Okay, so then we say, all right, then I'm going to pray that way. I want to speak the word and just say, I declare. I declare you are a good God. I declare you're a healing God. And I declare you're healing for this situation. I declare it for my friend. I, lately, at funerals, for some reason, I've been having a lot of private conversations with people. And it's just been eye-opening to uh, be able to talk to them and, and just the boldness of God. Because I'm going in there saying, I've got, I've got good news. I've got good news. Yeah, they're dead. But I've got some good news. I've got some good news. I, I want to tell you about it. I can't wait to tell you about it. Most of my funerals that I do, it, it's mostly the salvation message more than anything. Just simply and plainly as possible and concise. Not like this sermon. But it just goes, you know, just really concise. And I just go and I just, I can't wait to tell them about Jesus. But the Lord has been allowing some people to come up and minister and talk to them on a private matter. And I just feel it. I feel the boldness of God just coming on me. Not like I just can't wait to jump on them. Nothing like that. But just looking at them with love and saying, God loves this person so bad. He can't wait for me to tell them that he loves them and that he has a purpose for their life. And he can't wait for me to tell them that there's a way to them to know him and be set free from the, the brokenness of their life. And I'm not talking about those who just lost. I'm talking about those who come up and they'll just say, yeah, my life was, for instance, I had a, a young man come up to me, and I'm, I, I'm not going to give his name, this last funeral I went to, and as I was talking to him, he just came up to start talking, and so I just sat there listening. And just the love of God came over me just to listen to this guy and look at him as a son of God. He was not saved. He's not saved, but he was just telling me all this stuff that happened in his life and how the Lord had delivered him. Well, not, I mean, not the Lord delivered him, how he gave up certain things, drugs, and how he's, things are happening in his life. And then he mentioned someone that I knew, someone in our church. And he says, oh yeah, that person, that person has changed. That person has changed. And right then and there, the Holy Spirit says, now. I said, you know why that person has changed? Because they have God. They surrendered their life to God and they've experienced God in a very real way. And God wants you to experience him in a very real way. That's what was said. And this guy is like, well, yeah, well, yeah, you know. He, he was nice. He was polite and everything. And, uh, but I just, just, and I got to pray for him. I said, can I pray for you? So I prayed for him. A um, week later, uh, uh, I was with the person that they were talking about. I said, hey, I got to tell you a testimony that was said about you. The way you're living your life is such a way as others see it. And they see that you've been, they said, radically changed. Oh, yeah, that dude has really changed. What were you like before? So anyway, um, that person has really changed. And uh, he goes, oh, yeah. Uh, this morning he came to me. He says, hey, I've got a friend, a friend we were talking about. I got a text last night saying he wants to come and surrender his life. But he's sick. And he just got, found out he had COVID. Let's pray. Uh, you may be watching. I, I don't know if you're watching or not. Uh, God loves you. And we're going to pray for you right now. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you know him by name. You know him by heart. You're loved. God loves you. And God has made a way that you can experience that love. Your life right now may be out of whack, maybe shambles. It's broken. And you need, you need someone to help you with it. You need a miracle. I know a miracle working God and he loves you and this miracle working God wants to come into your life and make a difference. And I pray today that you would receive him. I pray that you would believe him. I pray that it would be faith would rise up within you to believe that. And that God would show himself to be so good and so real and so wonderful. He will deliver you from those situations, situations I know nothing about, but you do. And you've been praying about. Pray, give it to God. Say, Lord, if you are God and if you can do this, I give it to you and watch God work in your life. My God will do it. I don't have to make excuses for him. He's good, and he will do it in your life. So I pray right now that you would receive that. I pray that you receive that. Can't wait for you to come and, and be with your friend and pray together. But 
right now where you are, you can pray, you can receive Jesus. He wants to come into your life. He wants to empower you, to fill you so that you can be an overcomer and not be overcome by the world any longer. You can be an overcomer. And when you go through hard and difficult times, you have friends. Not only that, but you have the Spirit of God inside of you who will carry you and guide you and see you through and you will be set free. And I declare that over you right now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord God, I thank you. I thank you for your spirit. I thank you, God, that you're teaching us how to live a life of victory. And Lord God, I pray that we would not neglect these things that we have heard, that we've been taught by your word. Lord, we would apply them to our lives right now. Maybe as you're listening and you're praying that you need to say, God, I'm sorry. You need to start with point number three. Say, Lord, forgive me for my sins. Forgive me for this attitude. Forgive me for the past where I've just neglected you, not even thought about you in a long time. Not in a real sense. Not in a personal sense. And you can do that right now just by surrendering to God. God is willing and able. I love the part that he's willing. He's so willing. But not only is he willing, he is able. And he's able to do abundantly above and more anything that you could ever ask for. So as you're sitting there right now praying, surrender to God. Ask him to come and fill you again afresh. Hallelujah. Thank him for his spirit that dwells within you. Say, Lord God, I pray again for your baptism. I pray, Lord God, for a, a fresh and filling. Lord God, sink me. Take me under the waters of the Holy Spirit. May I come up alive, come up refreshed, come up victorious in Jesus' name. May your joy just overwhelm me, Lord God. May your, your presence just, just overwhelm me, Lord God, and your love would fill my heart. And like rivers of living water, it would just flow into my mind, my will, my emotions. It would flow into my words, Lord God, my words, how I treat my family, how I, what I talk to them, what I say. Lord, it would change my personality. That's what we want today. And Lord God, that's what you offer to every single one who would humble themselves and seek you. And Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you as your church today, your blood-bought church. We say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We hope you've enjoyed today's message. If you have made a decision to accept Christ as your Savior or in need of prayer, we would like to hear from you. Please contact us at either 574-223-7631 or email us at admin at faithoutreach.cc. For further information on our church, go to our website at www.faithoutreach.cc or like us on Facebook. Either way, you will find information on upcoming events, archive sermons, who we are, as well as other activities going on here at Faith Outreach Center. On behalf of Faith Outreach Center, this is Roger Vogel saying, God bless and thanks for listening.